Gesundheit. Gesundheit. Yeah. <laughs> and then the freeze frame, like, yeah. And yeah. only Matt though could do like, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, a, all right, buddy. Yeah. Right. Like, kind of a smile it's on really his hard face. To do, yeah. No. Yeah, it's like impossible. You have to be Walter Matthau to do that. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> All right, it's one fucking hour time. I, of course, am Evan Husney, and this is the show where we talk about one fucking hour. What, what is it? We talk about <laughs> it's one, one fucking movie, fucking movie for it? one fucking hour. Oh yeah, it's one fucking movie, and Trust we have me. just one fucking hour to do it to talk about that goddamn movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do we got here? We got to my left. We got Big T, Tom Fitzgerald. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? Hey man. Almost getting the ankle bracelet off next week, so, <laughs> you know, life's good. Oh, awesome. Life's That's good. Right. That's right. Yeah. Tom was part of the Nixium uh, cult and recently is, uh got the bracelet coming do? off next week, so it's great. <laughs> uh, all right. And uh, to my right, we also have, uh, as always here, <laughs> Mr. Marcus Herring. Marcus, welcome back. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. I can't believe this is number, 101? episode number 101. Ooh, I like that. The yeah. 101ers. That's yes. That's right. Episode 101, because of course, last week was our big milestone episode, the episode 100, where we absurdly did one fucking hour on one fucking hour, looking back at all of the, <laughs> our favorite moments uh, over the past, I guess, three years and the past 99 episodes of the show. So that was really fun. Uh, thanks, everybody who checked awesome. that out and it commented. Was Kaufman-esque, Charlie Kaufman-esque <laughs> yes. almost, right? It was a little meta, yeah. For sure. It was us. Episode 200, we're going to watch that episode back. <laughs> yeah. And then of course. Do that. <clears throat> right. Exactly. So that was a blast. I, I had I had fun with that. Very Thanks fun. to everybody who suggested clips for that or comments mm-hmm. on the video. We appreciate you. Um, mm-hmm. And something else that we uh, unveiled, I guess, or talked about on that episode last week was we got merch. One fucking hour t-shirts are here. <laughs> And they are available for pre-order. So as you are hearing this, there's approximately probably only a few days left where you have to get your pre-orders in uh, before we submit the order to the printers. So if you want a one fucking hour hand printed, screen printed, double sided shirt comes in both black and gray. Uh, hit the link in your description right now and hit and get that pre-order in. Be the envy of all your friends. That's you know, right. And, uh, High quality t-shirts. They with... are. They are. Yes. And, and now, now on the back is every episode up to the 100th, right? Like yes, it listed right. as if it was like a, a tour that's itinerary. Right. Right? That's a right. cheat sheet kind that's of, right. you know. There you go. I haven't seen that one. I got to see that one. You know, it's perfect. A little checklist. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, all the orders will be shipping by the end of April. So get them in right now. And uh, yeah, link in the description of this video. Or if you're listening to us on a podcast platform, it'll be in that description as well too. Pre-order your one fucking hour tease, man. And that's many more to come. We're going to do Momin shirts. We're probably going to do some other crazy shit. Who knows? Stay tuned. Um, Fredo and, shot first. Yeah, Fredo <laughs> shot first. Yeah, we got to do that. That'll be our breakout viral hit shirt for sure. Yeah. Um, and then we got to give a quick shout out to the Patreon, the one fucking hour Patreon. Um, that is, of course, at patreon.com slash one fucking hour is where you can sign up for just $5 a month and get instant access to all of our bonus episodes, audio commentary tracks, and early access to every episode you can be the cool kid in school listen to all these episodes before they drop on youtube or podcast apps or whatever so get in there uh, to support us Uh, we're actually dropping a new bonus episode it is available right now uh we did a little bit of a one fucking hour q a where we asked uh people on social media and our patrons uh to ask us anything and so (laughs) it's a fun uh little free free form q a sesh with us it was very fun i was surprised that we got like you know 60 questions or whatever the hell we got you know, it was yeah. pretty amazing. <clears throat> Next, we have B Gary nineteen thirty three on Patreon. <laughs> Thanks for being a patron. Right. Their question is: What would your guys's dream director writer star combo be? Every era combined. Uh, so is oh. there, is, I have mine combos. I'll start. Yeah. Here's my combo. Well, I want to see. Please. I want to see uh, Clint Howard and Andre Tarkovsky. <laughs> Oh, stop it. <laughs> I mean, who would? Uh, and, and really, oddly, no troll questions, which I was happy with. So we have a very respectful. Yeah, that's a relief. We can't we, lo- we have good. We, we've, we've cultivated a nice little grouping of 
human beings, I'd say, you know? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. You guys are all great human beings. So um, we're, that's available on the Patreon right now. If you're not signed up there, you can also, if you'd like, uh, scroll underneath this video, click the join button and become a Momin of the YouTube channel. It's just also five bucks a month and you get access to the same bonus content, including that episode. So appreciate everybody's support. That, of course, is either the YouTube channel or the One Fucking Hour Patreon. All right. All right, guys. So what are we talking about tonight for episode 101? Uh, we are getting back into our 70s sweet spot here, talking about more 70s flicks, uh, gritty 70s <laughs> flicks. And of course, we're talking about a movie we've mentioned before on, on this podcast. Very excited to get into it. We're talking about the taking of Pelham 123 from 1974. Very excited to finally get into this. So uh, one of the best there is of the decade. So shall we do it? Let's, Let's hit it. it. All right. Um, here is the clock. Of course, we got one hour to fucking talk about this movie. So here we go. And boom. And I'm just going to start off real quick with a brief synopsis action here on the movie. Taking of Pelham 123 from 1974. Um, all right. So in New York City, a criminal gang led by the ruthless Mr. Blue, played by Robert Shaw, I'm sure we'll get into in great detail, hijacks a subway car and threatens to start shooting one passenger per minute unless they receive a million dollars in cash from the city within an hour. On the other end of the line, crusty veteran transit policeman Zachary Garber, played by Walter Matthau, has his hands full dealing with the mayor's office and his hothead fellow cops while also trying to deliver the ransom before the deadline expires. So kind of a almost a modern blockbuster energy here in the not only the pacing, uh, but in the sort of plot, if you will, elements of this movie. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a brisk watch. Uh, like revisiting this movie, it holds up perfectly. It's super intense from scene to scene. The performances are fantastic. I mean, it's 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 yeah. so great to revisit. Tom, like did I, you say, it's, I, yeah. it, I just rewatched it too, and uh, it just feels like a masterclass in pacing. It's just uh, right. It just has it just has a little engine that just starts and it never ends right to the last frame, mm -hmm. and that's something that I was I don't know it was, it was really refreshing. You know, like uh, you know, then films could drag. And films today in their own way can really drag in different oh kinds God. of ways. But like yeah. this film, you know, puts to shame a lot of films, uh, contemporary films and um, and even new ones. So I was just really responding to um, sort of the magic. I'd like to talk about with you guys, like how does it work? Like the, the, the alchemy of like having that pacing, there's the editing, you know, and then, but also the story, maybe mm -hmm. keeping the story incredibly simple yeah. and almost having like no uh, characters, but archetypes only, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So we'll get into well, it. Well, one thing I really appreciated about it, maybe we can start off here, is that um, it, it's a very tight script. You know, this is a 90, ostensibly like a 90-ish to 100-minute movie, super tight, super fast-paced, as we mentioned. But, it, and it has a lot of great um, symmetry in its script where it sets up a lot of, you know, details earlier on in the film that it pays off ultimately. So it works as sort of a, you know, uh, a structure, uh, a, a sort of more conventional structured script. However, all of the conventional aspects of it are really offset by just this absolute fucking authenticity, off the chart authenticity mm. with uh, with with New York City. Yeah. You are yeah. seeing a very real snapshot of yeah. not only these fucking people that ride the subway and uh, those archetypes, but just also like how the subway works, how it functions. It's almost a documentary mm -hmm. on the little on a, dot yeah. indicator of it going down the, the line, you know? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it's just really cool to see that. And of course, just all of the absolute, you know, curmudgeon -y, uh, you know, sort of blue collar, just, you know, like, real. Uh, like, uh, Liverwurst and mayo chomping uh, <laughs> blue collar guys. Yeah, yeah, hey, <laughs> hey, you know, and they're just, it's, and of course, anytime you're playing with that and people with those kind of mugs, you know, and, and, you're, and you're playing in that, in that sandbox, uh, there's so much humor to be had with that. You it's know? inherent, yeah. You know, because these, these people are so eccentric and they're kooky yeah. and, and, and this film leans into that, you know, with like, hey, right. you must be a fruit cake. Uh, what's going on over here, you know? Yeah. And it's hey, like, whatever. Oh. Like, uh, so they crash. I got to get this train moving again, you know, <laughs> yeah, like, right. you know, like the priorities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marcus, and everyone's, really everyone's mad too. at each other and everyone's <laughs> cursing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, then yeah. just the actor choice for those, you know, the, the the comedy of it was fresh in their minds. That's why I think they cast people like 
you know, Jerry Stiller and Walter Matthau in it that have a like, good comedic timing. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Totally. Totally. And 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 something just real quick before we get into the cast and or you know or just New York in general is that of course spending you spend so much time in the in that single subway car with all of those you know mm-hmm. with all the hostages and it's great that the film allows each of those individual hostages to kind of have their moment too and i oh, and and, mm-hmm. and and i love that and it is reminiscent to me of course how could you not it would come later of course dog day afternoon you know, the same sort of thing. Like each yeah. of the hostages are kind of these. They're not. They're not just you know bystanders. These are people we we sort of wind wind up getting to know right. over the, the course. The prostitute, of this. the woman yeah. who's late for a job interview, mm-hmm. the drunk uh, you know, woman the, passed out on the on the, the woman passed out the whole time, which who is doesn't even classic, wake up when the train crashes. <laughs> got a classic punchline, you know, yeah, like yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, is this yeah. my stop, you know, and um, yeah, I mean. Uh, like uh so what what do we want to cover now like yeah uh, so i just want to have a brief note on the pacing before we move on just one thing that like that really propels the movie forward for me is just the intrigue and the mystery that they lay out like how are they going to pull off this heist like what are they doing true like you know and the way it unfolds you don't really know that's right like where it's going to go how they're going to do it what their plan is you're learning along with the officers as you go. Good point. Yeah. And so you're just you're really gripped by that. You know, they they lay it like you said. They set up like like the, you know, you're a good understanding of the, of the metro system, and then you're set. And then these guys come in to heist it or to take it over, and you're you're left wondering like where are they? What are they gonna What are they gonna do with it? How are they gonna pull this off? So yeah. that really and that goes all the way to the end too. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And. and- uh, yeah, so that's one thing that like really yeah, helps like the the, the whole forward. the thing you know because every time I see it, I sort of forget exactly the machinations, like you're saying, of of the heist, mm-hmm. and I'm like the whole Breakman's what is it called the Breakman's uh, the Dead Man's uh, Dead Man's Break Switch dead Switch, switch yeah. yeah yeah you know yeah right and so and then like they you know Matthew and his people are relying on that mm-hmm. and then they're like hold on think twice which is you know Matthew's always trying to the like intuition. like. Matt, that was perfect for for outsmarting these guys in this cat and mouse situation because he's mm-hmm. like, well, hold on, maybe they can override the system, you know, because he's starting to figure out that like there's yeah. someone from the inside of the uh, yeah. MTA mm-hmm. who maybe has some insights about mm-hmm. how things work, and just like watching that all play out is great. And 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 you're right, we are, we might as well be also in the control center, like trying to keep yes. up with them. Yeah, you that's. Know? That, that, that's what I wanted to mention too. It's a really good point, Marcus. Is this idea of I think another way this movie succeeds is it lets the audience in, sort of on uh, the fun of trying to figure out uh, how these guys are going to pull off this heist. You know, it's it's like uh, similar with Zodiac, like a movie like that we've talked about it's in mm-hmm. the archives, where you're sort of along for the investigation. You're not just standing as a bystander while two characters through exposition, you know, already are ahead of the story. You know, yeah. so it's I think mm-hmm. it's very smart and uh, smartly written in that way that we don't understand how this is even going to work, and I think that perplexes the main characters and that adds an, an mm-hmm. element of intrigue. And um, look, it's a it was a good plan. They almost yeah. got away with it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You know? Totally, absolutely. One, uh, one last note on the pacing is that also it kind of takes place in real time, like almost, pretty almost, much. Almost, yeah. Know? So, uh, you know. Totally. There's, no, there's nothing to spare. There's no, you know, they yeah. have to like it's, kind of it's, move for Let's call it like it's an afternoon movie. You know, like mm-hmm. sometimes yeah. there's like, everybody talks about like there's an overnight movie, a one yep. day movie, like American Graffiti. This is like an afternoon movie. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> yeah. if I can, if you'll indulge me just one second, like if I wanted to drill down and then we can move on. Yeah. New York City itself. Sure. And how, um, how strange really old New York City subways are, <laughs> you know, like there's no resemblance to the modern subway system in New York. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is like, there's this movie called Gang Wars, 1976 mm-hmm. movie Gang Wars pretty weird and it's it's, there's a scene where the monster is like attacking this woman and the train car that they're on it's like there's like wood like in the 70s they still had like wood component like subway cars and i'm like god damn it it's like 1918 kind of thing so what i'm saying is it's like it's it's it, it like and all of it and the control center like um there's something about the rot and the and the rust of like how 
yeah. a city that's we're, we're witnessing crumbling slowly that was once mm-hmm. peaking let's say like after world war ii yeah it was really on its up 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 and then it starts slowly corroding and rotting for all kinds of reasons and the mm-hmm. wood is rotting it's also a component in french connection where you see like how everything's a little everything's dingy and dirty mm-hmm. and poorly lit and poorly run with gripey you know uh workers all right just, that is around the- it's it's gone like that you you can only experience that through a movie like this because it's mm-hmm. not a new york anymore mm-hmm. is this around the time that they were like new york was like defaulting on their loans a couple years later right, right. real mm-hmm. essentially the same it's leading time, up yeah. to it yeah and and it's crazy because it's like the experience that you know you can read on the internet of you know walter matthau in and 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 others who worked on this film and what it was like because they because they filmed a lot of these uh subway sequences in in one of the you know um i guess non-functional subways they had in brooklyn the the court street mm-hmm. station in brooklyn uh yeah. which was closed you know as of the 40s or whatever but it still had <laughs> obviously rat problems and disease problem or you know <laughs> bacteria <laughs> gone wild yeah i heard that like they all ba- ba- barely got uh like alive or barely stayed alive because of even just like not catching whatever mysterious unrecognized by modern science bacteria right that mm-hmm. was like like festering it's yeah and, yeah they had to wear like masks and stuff yeah the shooting right because every time you move something like a cloud of dust would kick right out, right and no like, actually even worse of, it would be uh you'd be shooting and then someone would do something that would cause this toxic bacteria dust to to fly yeah. up in the air and you'd have to wait for it to settle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it took a long time for the yeah. disgusting bacteria dust to kind of like like hit home again wow i guess yeah. the reason that 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 line was unused was it was like built it was like a custom built like a subway like entry for like a politician who didn't want to like have to oh. go to work like walk oh, very wow. far for work so like that. they built it for him custom at some point and then it got you know left abandoned just used so that's yeah. why it was open well anyway just <laughs> like just in encapsulation we can move on the 70s new york city is maybe not depicted any better than this film and in all its yeah. crazy joy because the film is not like a bummer and an indictment of like a rotting no. city it's actually like a wild thing because i don't know something about new york again i didn't live any of this but like i've heard that like it's falling apart but it was a lot of fun because it felt kind of chaotic and like out of control mm-hmm. and there's a sense of that in this film you know what i mean and it's mm-hmm. loose you know it's like a loose new york city where it's almost like look everything's fucked up so whatever who cares yeah. you know yeah <laughs> and uh one, one other thing before we get into punk uh, rock I, is I, it's doing right then you know in that totally yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and just Ramones first show, right? <laughs> that's right. right. Yeah. Uh, one thing before we get into just kind of talking about, you know, math, I want to lead heavy with that, but uh, it's just, you know, one more thing in the culture, cultural context, if you will, of New York at the time is like you were saying, it's edging towards a financial crisis. There's obviously crime is on the rise in the city, um, you know, and, and, and subways were, were, were being looked at as a, a not safe place to be because there's probably crime was escalating in this. And I think this film sort of shows that in sort of a minorly satirical, humoristic way, of course. But um, and, and it's interesting that the that New York City itself was wary of how it was going to be portrayed in this mm-hmm, movie mm-hmm. or how specifically the MTA was going to be portrayed in in terms of and uh because they were really worried about copycats they were worried about people being inspired by what they're seeing on screen and trying to do carry out something uh yeah. similar to seeing in the movie and so the like for example tom you were saying that the right after this movie came out there were no pelham trains yeah. exiting at you, one you'll, you'll never because that's a real thing i guess like um you know different trains start at you know this st- station and at in this, this case this line is begins at pelham and it starts at it's it's a it's a time one two three mm-hmm. you know right. one twenty three you know and um they just got rid of that one like that's it's almost like an unlucky number yeah like it's you no know, like like a 13 floor elevator kind of thing yeah <laughs> but then um but then the other tidbit which is uh it's just amusing and it gives you an idea it's one weird thing about this movie that's not like it's time it's not a snapshot is that train in reality would have been absolutely head to toe, head to toe covered in graffiti. Now, right. By 1974, it was kind of as people think it's more of an 80s thing, but it was those would have been covered with little tags and even pieces were happening. Mm-hmm. And they absolutely insisted not one 
you know, like marker uh, strike on any of it. Um, they Is that didn't, because I, they, they probably also didn't want to, it made them look bad. They thought New York city would think. And then also they didn't want to influence people, you know. I thought that and and also the fact that maybe it would it, it wouldn't be as timeless because they felt that like graffiti wouldn't be a thing that would stick around forever, you know? <laughs> oh naive. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. The, the plight of the mid seventies, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, right. But just and one thing about crime, I'm glad you mentioned that too. Just this whole zeitgeist of New York City at the time. I, I was I'm from the eighties and I would visit New York a lot. I lived just outside of it. And you would just get simple advice and just go, if you got a nice ring, yep. it's a ritual. Turn the ring around mm -hmm. without without a doubt. You don't need to because motherfuckers wouldn't fight to get your ring off you if it looked valuable. They just cut off your fucking finger. <laughs> that, I, I saw that on the news, you know? <laughs> Yeah, crazy, so crazy. It was an it was a lawless. It, people think it's bad now, in New York. It's not yeah. doing great, but like it hey. was a fucking wild hey. outlaw land. Yeah, no, of course, and and uh, but you know, so 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 the result of all this was that the MTA basically made the film's producers take out a twenty uh, twenty million dollars in insurance policies, making sure that this wouldn't inspire a real life copycat hijacking. Um, and you know, we should mention too. Of, of course, that, you know, hijacking, the idea of hijacking a plane or something was also in the zeitgeist, right? There's this is sort of the golden age of plane hijackings. Yeah, man. It was in Absolutely. the mid 70s. And so another thing that's, you know, t you know, taken out of the headlines, you're sort of combining the idea Absolutely. of what's happening in New York City, the, the violent fervor, the crime. Uh, and let, let's do kind of a plane style hijacking, but in the subway. Yeah, so. it's funny because, again, <laughs> in modern times, we don't even think about that as a thing. I barely really even understand that. But like hijacking was so prevalent, hijacking of planes, you know, like like fly us to Cuba, you know, with a gun in the cockpit yep. that, you know, it was parodied. It was in the movie The Out of Towners. I think it was in uh, Woody Allen's Bananas, you know, and like uh, it was so commonplace that it was, uh, you know, it became a comical, uh, you know, like a uh, punchline. But the meta idea here is very, or the simple big idea is just like, take it from a plane hijack situation right. to a train, you know? <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It's the big idea, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. High concept. Uh, so, okay, let's get into Walter Matthau because at this time, it's very interesting. Him being sort of a noted comedic, more comedic uh, actor mm -hmm. takes a kind of a career change in this time period in the 70s. And starts to do a series of really great and authentic, raw crime films. Um, we're talking about The Laughing Policeman, which is Big a film. Big fans of that here, yeah. Huge. I would love to cover that at some point um, we will. here on the show. I'm sure we'll get to it. And what's really cool about that movie is, you know, that, that movie, like, it was selling itself as uh, like uh, like this movie is so authentic it makes any other movie just seem like a movie you know that was what its yeah. tagline was and it was really all about real time authenticity procedure capturing these moments that like you know i think in the, in the first five ten minutes it's you seeing someone getting resuscitated you know uh by like emts like in real time you'd never see something like yeah. that yeah so it's really cool that you know something like uh authenticity in crime films is something that's really being represented in this time period. So Walter Matthau's in that movie, and he's also, of course, in Charlie Varick, which is a, a great heist film where, where he plays uh, you know, the main criminal in that film. And then, of course, you have this movie, Taking a Pelham 123, yeah. so very and interesting. I just, I mean, I could look into it, I guess, but I've never understood. I just sort of like the idea of just letting it go and not really understanding why that happened. Because I think mm -hmm. if it's 1968 and you're seeing him as, um, what's it, uh, uh, Oscar Madison in yeah, the I'm film, not. The Odd Couple, yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go, oh, you know what? Get him in a gritty crime film, yeah. you know, with like on the street cops, you know, car chases. It's like, what? Walter Matthau? Okay. <laughs> You know, um, but it's, it's but it's, it does work. You know, yeah, it's really hard to unsee him as that character. In fact, that that songs with the odd couple themes been playing in my head all day. You know, just because every time I see him, there I think go. of that. Well, that and Bad News Bears, I guess. But those sure. two, yeah, you know. and yeah. it's funny too because he it was an it was an oasis of these films. He did a bunch, and then he mm -hmm. stopped doing it. And I was just it's just kind of cool. I mean, it's almost like I want to just credit him. He was like maybe he was getting a little bored. 
with mm-hmm. his um, persona, you know, mm-hmm. and like, uh, I want to kind of chew on a different kind of characterization, different kind of film, you know, dramas, like, like ugly, weird violence and stuff like that. It's just like, let me just put this way, like, um, Jack Lemon didn't do that. You know, his mm-hmm. counterpart in The Odd Couple. Mm-hmm. Like he yeah. didn't do like French connection movies, you know? So, <laughs> you know, but, it, but, it, but again, it works. It wasn't like a strange idea where it's like, this isn't really fitting. He fits like a glove and he always brings a kind of humor to it because sure. he's natively kind of a comedic actor so that his comedic tone in the context of these gritty situations very cool you know yeah and i'm you know the tarantino's watching that shit you know <laughs> yeah. closely you know, the tonality <laughs> yeah. thing you know totally yeah and that's something that's so great about this movie in general is just that it has such a great sense of humor uh for so much of it you know and and yeah. it never takes away from the tension uh no in the film mm-hmm. it just it just That's adds hard. it just it is true it, it is hard and it just it it just makes the characters so much more rich you know mm-hmm. to uh and likable quite frankly uh the fact that there's just so much humor brought to them yeah. you know and so many crazy lines like what's that guy uh, mr gray is like in the first five minutes he's like i'm gonna shoot your peepee off if you don't uh and i'll shoot your peepee off Get out of my yeah. way. You know, it's like, what? Uh, yeah. Was it Hector Alonso? Yeah. Yeah, he's amazing. He's pretty yeah. scary, yeah. you know, yeah. like uh, he is. trigger finger Vietnam veteran or something, you know, yeah. like, like, like I'm not even doing this for the money. I'm doing it for the kicks. You yeah. Know, that yeah. Yeah. When do we start killing? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but there's another heavy hitter in this film, in addition to Walter Matthau, uh, one we've talked about a little in depth when we did the Jaws audio commentary track uh, oh, up in our Patreon. Dude. Shout out uh is uh robert shaw man i mean i love it's like you know I, i'll praise matho in this film but with equal love it's just robert shaw it wouldn't be the same film for me yeah if he didn't do that character and uh it's just the delivery the, well it's also about the economy of the lines delivered like he's born to deliver these yes you know these like like uh at least like um you know curt instructions <laughs> and he doesn't give anything. He gives a little bit. Which will then be put in stacks of 200 bills each, bound with two thick elastic bands. Because he does like the cat and mouse with Mathau, because mm-hmm. they, you know, they, they talk on the phone or the, you know, the, the dispatch a lot. And there is a little bit of cat and mouse. That's the only give he gets. He doesn't obviously even know who these guys are that are his, you know, partners in crime. Mm-hmm. He's a to- he's totally closed down. And he's basically like a like a, a mass. It's a it's a beautiful rendering of a mastermind. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 that calculating way he delivers his lines. But I but my big thing is just like uh, you've got fifty nine minutes and fifteen seconds, and yeah. then he goes back to a crossword puzzle. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. Like he's like killing time by like you know kind of sorting out like this you know the top top row you know yeah um yeah anyway and and, and he's he's so uh, oh sorry go ahead Marcus you want to say something. Oh, no. Well, go ahead. If you're going to okay. talk about Shaw, I was going to talk about things. Yeah, yeah, Shaw. This is Shaw time. Um, is uh, just that, like, obviously you can tell it's someone who's pre-planned this for so long. He's yes. so cool mm-hmm. and calm and collected, and he's thought of everything, and it's all, you know, that's why he's so comfortable, I think, doing the crosswords. But what's mm-hmm. amazing is in that um, through the sort of back and forth with Walter Matthau, he, you know, Matthau gets that opportunity, of course, to outsmart him. Where Matthau, mm-hmm. halfway through the movie, maybe way too, you know, more than halfway into the movie, realizes finally, after all of the stress of trying to get the money down into right. the subway in under an hour, that these guys don't have eyes on the street. They can't see right. what we're doing, mm-hmm. you know? And he just and, immediately clicks the dispatch and goes, like, Yep, just got here. Oh, Macro, that's it. Tell him one, two, three, the money has arrived. Repeat, the money has arrived. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's on the platform, you know, and he, and he was, but he was about to not say that and instead deliver the news, the reality of like, yep. five more minutes, guy, give us five more minutes, right. you know, and, yep. uh, and that's a big part of the film that I love is um, the pacing of getting all that cash mm-hmm. yep. street level from, Great. God, like the 90s. Yeah. to like you know like uh, union square or something you know what i yeah. mean and it's like nearly impo- it is impossible they don't quite make it you know yeah it's amazing well, one of the great joys of the whole movie i think is just seeing those two guys go head to head to you've got two it's a great hollywood it's one of the things that people love hollywood movies for you've got yeah. two esteemed actors of equal stature who are both like monster huge actors 
going head to head in a chess match against each other, and then when they finally it. meet up, you're just you're you're filled with this elation. It's that thing. It's that Hollywood trick that they yeah. they mastered, you know, decades ago. Or and, and totally. Is, and they also have very joy. different acting. It's like two different acting disciplines are happening. Well, yeah, they're, they're almost like opposite characters you've got the british guy the american guy the sort of working class goofball the you know uh shaw's got this like up uh it just to an i don't know we don't know his background but yeah. british sounds smart to americans <laughs> but right? also the, so well, like we were saying a minute ago like highly educated and but like, also the ice cold sort of, precision and yep. matthew is kind of sloppy you know like liverwurst sandwichy kind of like vibe you know yep yep but they're sort of like they're sort of opposites that are yeah. playing against each other it's got that kind of like um it reminds me a little bit, this is a little off, but just that World War II generation thing where it's like the Americans would figure out a way to get through it with just gumption and like raw working class, you know, mentality yeah, of just right, pushing right. through, you know, with in, in contrast to the European like planned precision, right. you know, there's a lot of right. that in World War II, like just of Amer you know, the guy is coming back with this uh pride in how american american ingenuity could overcome yeah. like the regimen of like european society you know? mm. like bending the rules you well, know and like matho yeah. does bend the rules yeah and just tells him that yeah the money's on the platform and it's not you know because he's uh because you have to think on your feet yeah. you know in, in, exactly. a, in a battle right right yeah and 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 uh again it's 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 a sinister part of shaw's character it's a great mechanic for the script, and it, it, it just it works is the idea of, okay, you guys got to get <laughs> like not only a million dollars in under an yeah. hour, but you have to get it in, in cash. exactly this. Yeah, not only in cash, but in these type of bills stacked in this way, you know, and follow all these, mm -hmm. you know. Fives, all, tens, yeah. Yeah, like all mm -hmm. these rules, and, and that adds so much unbelievable tension. It's almost an impossible And, and the thing death. is, the, the way uh, Shaw gives off the directives – Everyone on the other end of the, the, the dispatch, you know, um, they know that he's not kidding around. Mathau knows. They all know yeah. that, like, when he says 59 minutes and 50 seconds, like, he really means it. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, well, and, like, uh, this guy's he's not killed that around. guy. Yeah, he's already killed yeah. that working class station uh, man. And he did that as an ex that's terrible. It's so sad. He does. I you love know, that's that one of those classic. Uh, there's another, like, sort of joyous movie manipulation that happens there. You get to know the guy on his first day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, totally. yeah, and then totally. he's the one who gets it in the back, and it's like, God, fuck, yeah. dude! Like we got to kind of know that guy. You yeah, know? I also, I also love the guy, the the what is he, uh, the station manager, the station manager guy, the guy who's like, you know, totally like, like I'm oh. gonna have your ass for this. Yeah, like, <laughs> like the guy. Like, oh he, yeah, when I'm he gonna... just runs to the train, he's, yeah, he's like, like uh, <laughs> I don't give a shit if you're trying to rob. That's my train. You're yeah. trying to rob. <laughs> yeah, right. The hell with you! I'm coming on board. That's Total very New York. New York. That's very New, York. New York. Just like I'm gonna get the fuck down there, see what the yeah. fuck's going on. You know? All right, pal, what's your problem? Yeah, you know, right. like, yeah, yeah. That's exactly. a great characterization. I love him, <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, but what is amazing? What you were saying, I think, is the fact that uh, Mathau's the one that can tell this guy's for real. You know, everybody else mm -hmm. is kind of yeah. like, what are you? Exactly. Uh, this guy's a wacko, cuckoo guy. Exactly. You're gonna you're gonna exactly. let you know, let him, uh, you know, run the show here. But no, but they. You know, and he by you know because of that, and this sort of back and forth these two actors get into, which is amazing. And they're never in the same room until that amazing final scene, and the you know mm -hmm. on the tracks itself. So that's another great you know just mechanic. And, and I think Matthew is seeing um, the elegance of the plan. Yeah, right. You know, like he's seeing. You know what sure. I mean? Like it's being executed. Like not bad. Like oh, he's doing this now. Like mm -hmm. okay, this guy's sharp. Okay. Yeah. Right. You know, stand totally. our toes here. This is not a goofball person. Right. Because he's, you know, most criminals, you know, it's funny that you, you see crimologists who are like, don't worry too much about these people who rob you. Cops, you know, like criminals are pretty stupid, you know? Yeah. And I think, I think he's, that's true in some way. But when you, but so what I'm saying is Matthew's conditioned to be like, oh, dumb robber didn't think this through. And like, okay, now you're cornered. <laughs> but like, he's like, Matthew, okay, I got to, you know, I got I need another cup of coffee here for, um, yeah. you know, this Robert Shaw guy. Totally. Yeah. Mr. And, Blue. Yeah. And one other <laughs> uh, great character in this, uh, you know, of course, classic actor from Psycho uh, is Martin Balsam, of course, in this movie, yeah. which is great, oh, too. Oh, God. In it is that, you know, he is uh, portrayed or written as sort of maybe the most sympathetic of the bad guys, quote unquote, because here's somebody who has been, I guess, wronged by the MTA, 
which is very interesting. You know, well, he lost- a, that's another New York thing. Disgruntled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. He's got a chip <laughs> on his shoulder. You yeah. know, and but but he's also frequently portrayed and cut to a lot after any of the other bad guys kills anybody else. He's not killing anybody, but he's reacting to yeah. it like, oh, Jesus, ah, you know, he's in over his head a little bit. Yeah, honest. he's in over his head. He's never seen anything like this. And so we can sympathize with that. We almost kind of want to see him. There's some tension in wanting to see him get away in those final moments. Where, You're right. You know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shaw, you know, it isn't obviously he's, he, he kills himself. Right. Which he's like a fucking shark. <laughs> yeah, right. No, uh, no reference intended. Right, right. So he has like a, yeah, he's got a gripe. <laughs> right. And um, so it's, 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 it's very interesting. And then of course the final scene, which is classic. So Do, classic. You want know, to just like, <laughs> Just sure. rock and roll through the the greatest ending of all time, or sure. yeah, <laughs> just real not? quick, you know, a little jam session. It, it, it's it's it, talk about um, you know, we're talking about like the sort of the uh, the economy of style to mm-hmm. get to this beautiful pacing. The last scene, uh, the last scenes, the last moments happen at this really killer pace on their own. It's almost like a mini movie in itself. Like yeah, like um, you know, things wrap up kind of you know in the sense of like Robert Shaw's dead. Um, you know, the, you know, the, the people are safe more or less in the, in the car, you know, and it's like, okay, but wait a minute, dun, 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 like, like, uh, like Matho's like, where is the money? And there's an outstanding guy. Not everyone, all the other guys are dead. The three, there's a fourth guy, what's going on. And the, there's great filmmaking where they go like, oh, it's not him. And it's like more comedy. It's like, oh, couldn't be him. Guy doesn't have any legs, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Remember that, you know? Yeah. And so and then they knock and then, um, there's great sort of like tension comedy yep of um uh, uh, you know where he's like he throws the money you know quickly into, into a his oven and then like yeah, you know they want to light the cigarette yep. uh with the oven is like, i'll get that you know like uh, and it's all <laughs> so beautifully uh acted edited paced mm-hmm. written and then it gets to guys greatest line ever Gesundheit. Gesundheit. <laughs> <laughs> and then the freeze frame like yeah Gesundheit. And only Matho could do like, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, a, all right, buddy. Yeah, right. like kind of a smile it's on really his face. Hard to do, yeah, no. yeah, it's like impossible. You have to be Walter Matho to do that. And then, it, <laughs> and it's just so beautiful. It freeze frames, music cue, dun dun dun. dun, dun. It's fuck. Yeah. And then it just credits. <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. Go home. Yeah. Good. They, they if don't... it was a modern movie, they would turn that last thing into like another half hour, right? Oh, if it was made exactly. In, <laughs> yeah. in fact, yeah. do they do that in the 2009 version? Do they turn Let's, the last thing Let us thing not into... speak of such things. <laughs> <laughs> they do everything wrong. I have seen the, the reboot. It's, they I do haven't. everything wrong, and they yeah. add like, you know what they do? Just this moment of comparison to how shitty um, <laughs> things can get and how this film is, is cool. It gets into the psychology you know, like you don't know anything about Robert Shaw, but they mm-hmm. try to get under the hood a little bit of the the the, the reboots protagonist or antagonist. It's you know, Travolta, right? Yeah, with bald head, like uh, the ain't it cool period, <laughs> like you said earlier. And like anyway, ain't what I'm trying cool. to say is, it's like some psychoanalysis, like like dime store psychoanalysis happening. You know, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, but this film doesn't have right. that. It's like they, no they, time. They, uh, adaptation they do the adaptation thing where they explore that you know cop and criminal are of the same mind. right exactly right. <laughs> like like yeah like an adaptation he's like uh cop criminal are interchangeable yeah you know, right. back to the yeah. coin uh for every re- for any references to that see every film ever you know, yeah, right. quote, yeah. uh, quote adaptation yeah, yeah exactly right, exactly right, right. um oh but this God. film but again back to the good movie the good pelham uh doesn't do anything even remotely like that you no know? no no, it's 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 awesome and it's pure. Well, um, it seems like the the director like had real humble kind of point of view on the film too. Like he's like a TV director, and mm-hmm. his approach was like, I just thought we were making another heist film, like a TV show, you know. And it right. does kind of have that. Like it has a lot of those hallmarks of like a seventies tv show sure but it's like the best episode right, of the right, right, 70s right. tv show you know yeah no totally well some of the uh, uh, there's some camp so that again i love it all the enjoyable camp of the um the people on the train mm-hmm. you know like the 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 the, the stereotypical archetypes yeah you know what i mean yeah mm-hmm. like uh hey i got a date coming up in 10 minutes you know and she's obviously the prostitute you know, yeah, like, right. you know that kind of thing right yeah <laughs> well w- one for thing, example w- one thing that's also another good move that this movie did that um 
you know, even though it is, you know, Joseph Sargent, right? This is his name, I believe. Mm-hmm. He's the director. Yep. Um, but what a smart choice, man, to get a banger of a fucking DP on this movie. Um, oh, yeah. Because they knew that, A, it was going to be tricky to shoot in the subway. It's going to be dark, you know, so we got to get someone who knows what the fuck they're doing. And yeah. second of all is we're going to be in a small confined space uh, for most yeah. of this movie, and we're going to need to shoot mm-hmm. that shit fucking wide. And uh, so the aspect ratio of this film, I believe, is... What is it? It's, two, three, five? It, I think it's it is. It's anamorphic. Right? Right? It is anamorphic, so. yeah. So, mm-hmm. Which is really cool, and that gives it a whole nother kind of gravitas you know uh, which is so unlike television the square yes. you know yeah yeah, it, yeah. It elevates it you know the, the uh, material yeah the dp is a monster owen roisman he yeah. did french connection network oh. tootsie the oh. exorcist what? the heartbreak Ooh. kid oh. wow. three days of the condor and oh. tom's number one favorite movie of all time sergeant pepper's lonely hearts Club. <laughs> oh, jesus christ <laughs> You got me. Guilty as charged. <laughs> wow. But that's he is a, a monster resume. cinematographer. I no, mean, uh, that's total respect. Monster. Yeah. So we're Friedkin a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a total great respect. There's a great featurette with him talking about how he did it and, you know, pulled it off. And it's weird. They used a lot of natural light, not natural lighting, but existing lighting, you know, in the of subway the tunnels. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did this, you know, wicked, cool. Cinem- true cinematographer tricks. Like it's going to be dark in there. We need to see the shadows. So let's pre-flash the film, pre-expose it to light to like make the shadows more rich. You know, those kind of like genius that's cool. cinematographer tricks. Uh, that's cool. You, you know, replacing the light bulbs in, in the with yeah. like brighter lights, but then right. like spraying it with hairspray to kill the uh, the glare. You know, the the hot spots, whatever. Oh, All yeah. these like wow. genius like yeah. little cinematographer tricks, but really just using like then uh, really kind of the existing light. I guess the challenge was. They would have to break down the lights every day. The MTA made them break down all the lighting every day. So they're like, we have to do this like pretty light and move fast. So even in the office, like the office, you know, which has a great look, the uh, yeah. sort the of MTA one? station where like M- M- Matha's office, that great oh, yeah. like fluorescent lighting. He said they basically yeah. just walked in there, flipped on the lights and they're like, okay, it's lit. And occasionally they'd bring in like another like little like eye light or something, but yeah, it seems like just a real economy of yeah. lights, you know, which is something you don't think about a lot in something when you're shooting underground that they would be able to pull that off. But you know, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah, it has a great look. Uh, of course, that movie does. Um, and I guess one thing too we should talk about is you know yeah we've been talking about the humor, but also one thing of course that makes it very seventies and of its time is sort of how it juxtaposes just fucking ice cold violence, you know, and and how there's just sections of this film when you, like we were saying earlier, you get to know somebody and then boom, they're dead, (laughs) you know? Yeah. And it's brutal. Just get mowed down. Yeah. 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 And it freaks the shit out of everybody in the car. Yes. You know, like, uh, not, it's not cute anymore, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And it's, um, yeah, so I don't know. It's 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 uh, it has a it has an amazing tone in that way. Um, and well, the tension between the the criminals too, right? Like you've got one that's more murderous, wild card, kind of yep. the the wrong calculation that he made that you know Robert Shaw's character made was hiring that guy. That was a flaw. Guy. Yeah, and he immediately realized that. Mm-hmm. If I was him, I would have shot that guy like five minutes into the heist because <laughs> he was just a liability. Like yeah. however mm-hmm. much coverage. He had, by the way, when, I got to say, you know, we're talking about the, the criminals. So it's four guys, Robert Shaw, yeah. Martin Balsam is the guy who's only hired because he's an ex MTA guy and he knows his How way around works. cars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's the, I think it's Hector Alonso is the, uh, you yep. know, the uh, trigger happy wild card. And he's yep. a lot of fun. And uh, then there's this weird fourth guy and like, you'd never see him. He's never addressed. You <laughs> yeah. never hear him. You never talk to him. He's just some, he's like the guy, right? Like, isn't mm-hmm. that kind of funny? And he's, you know, another weird. I got another weird factoid about that guy. There's okay. something else that he's the in a lot guy? that you never see him in, but he's there a lot. He is the neighbor in Home Improvement that yes. you never see. Oh, get the out! Actor, no, I swear to God, he's the actor in Home Improvement oh, yeah. who lives behind the fence. Like the, I don't even know that show, guy? but I know that that character exists. Yeah. But uh-huh. 
<laughs> that's really weird fact that's wow. so weird yeah. yeah that guy he's like yeah that's what he's known for mr. anyway I just brown thought, mr brown th- mr brown says like mr shit oh <laughs> so, don't, 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 <laughs> don't 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 do that not here not here sorry i just know you yeah. know yeah, Reservoir Dogs no, stole yes. it. It's yeah. funny. I I swear, when, the first time I saw it, Reservoir Dogs, I went like, "Oh, Pelham, what are you doing here?" Like, yeah, like, like, yeah. it was my first exposure to, um, you know, Quentin Tarantino's nods yeah. to his favorite movies, and I was See, I like, "I wasn't old enough to pick I, up on that." Right. So I was just but, like, but, wow, but what I'm saying is like, I, but right, but I was just saying like, "All right, I know what that is," and then I was like. Do I like that? Like, is that cool? Like, it's kind of cringe, you know. Like, uh, right, know. W- it's all like wink. I know. Like for you guys who know Pelham, like burr, 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 Easter egg, and it's like, what are you doing? Because in my humble opinion, it's distracting. You know, it's like just have your characters in a story. Like they wouldn't do it in Pelham, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't. Right. I would dare say what? Like know? where they're getting their names? You mean? that well i mean they wouldn't have winking allusions oh, to like casablanca movies. or something you know <laughs> like, fuck well, that shit. yeah 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 for sure seems juvenile yeah um well one of the one of the other just great little set pieces in this movie too is when the uh when the train in in reverse is engaged which i don't think is a real thing um but somehow this movie sort of explains right that the that that was their trick that was their secret right. tech was being able to engage this bizarre mode where the train could go backwards uh and i think it needed that right in in terms of being able to to make this work and make sense um the heist he, yeah yeah the heist the story and and so it's it's interesting that you you have it is a great sequence uh again where again we're ramping up the tension and it's going even crazy and it's done even better than than french connection is the idea of just this train going bananas you know down the track yeah it's pretty terrifying i think i get you know sometimes when i've seen the film and the last time i just watched it recently i was like how scary is that you know what i mean like um like all right big deal like uh, it's going fast you're going forward and like it's just like i'm i'm kind of dumb that way i'm like 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 is this terrifying and you start screaming like a roller coaster but i i'm noticing that the characters of the passengers in the film they are it's it's dawning on them yeah. they're like putting the pieces like remember like in those those little parts of the movie where it's just like we're going fast mm-hmm. where are we going yep where, when and how are we stopping yeah. start screaming you yeah. know and, th- and that always <laughs> i always get caught up in that because i'm always like all right you're going kind of fast going forward all right you're on the train, you know, well, whatever. They do those say, guys are gone, the criminals. And then it's just like, how is this going to end? You know? Yeah. And there's no one, basically also the no one's flying the plane thing. Like there's no one in the uh, yeah. control yeah. booth or whatever. And that's, that. that's Scary. great, great tension. And, and um, the, uh, uh, well, th- th- there is that realization where they're saying, oh my God, it's going 70 miles an hour, you know, uh, which is... <sighs> I mean, that would feel that's pretty not, crazy. That's pretty fast for a subway, isn't it? That's very fast for a subway. <laughs> like, like, how fast would a subway go normally? Right, they like, shouldn't I, go I, that fast. Like, I'm, no, but I mean, I'm not good at this. Like, a, a subway that's going at a good clip is going like... I don't know, 40, 40 miles an hour, maybe? 40? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That sounds so like about twice right. as fast. Yeah, but right. it's it's And then it's genius because then it's like, you know, they can track the train and how fast it's going, and they think that mm-hmm. the criminals, that's their getaway, but of course it's not. So it's got the diversion, you know, which is sure. smart. Super got to have the diversion. Got to have the diversion, and, and it worked out. So um, anyway, uh, well, yeah. But moving, the, you know, going through the paces of the movie, it's like uh, sure. I do love Robert Shaw's end. Oh. I think it has a certain kind of like brute, mm-hmm. poetic kind of element to it. He's just, to the end, this guy is outrageous. He's just like, uh, hey, chief. How you doing on the uh, capital punishment here in New York State? <laughs> it's like, uh... Do you people still execute in this state? What? Oh, execute. No, not at the moment. Yeah. Don't have it. And he's like, bye. Yeah. Third degree. Or, yeah. or third third rail, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, third rail. And then he makes a face that's not quite comical, but it does look really terrifying. Like, it's what when I think of being electrocuted, I do think of that shot. Yeah of his face it's like that frozen because you guys ever get a little electrocuted sure. oh yes okay really it freezes you a little dude, bit dude yeah exactly does. stuck there yeah. yeah exactly and i it's and it's almost like you have to dislodge from the thing that is you know zapping you and it's yeah, like yeah. but i can't move 
Yeah. It happened to me twice in my life. Me Fucking too. Fucking scary my, shit. My, uh, so you guys, what happened to you guys? Like my, on a set or something? Well, when I was a little kid, my like I had a clown lamp that was <laughs> unplugged by my bed, and I pinched the uh, things to stick it back in Ooh, the socket. Oh, yeah, no thanks. Ooh. And then I got like a zzzz. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, I, yeah. I, and I you I just froze it. right there. But yeah, I was frozen, and eventually, I don't know how it got off, but. God, mine's that feeling. mine's really scary. Uh, mine is oh. my brother was uh, like you know he liked to build electronic things from scratch, and he built a strobe light. Okay, uh, okay, a, a homemade strobe light. <laughs> homemade thing. strobe light. Yeah, kind of weird. And it had and he would turn it on, but in the, he didn't make like a, a switch on the outside to turn it on. It was only you took the casing off for some stupid reason and then turned it on from the inside. And one time when I was turning it on, I got my finger stuck in there and it was electrocuting oh. me so bad that he had to he he actually hit me off of it because he was thank God. Was in the same right. Room. Just push you away from making contact. Yeah. And it was like, what if he wasn't there? I know. I think about that sometimes. Like there'd Yikes. be no Evan. There'd be no fucking Or Evan's hours. being fed yeah. like like banana pudding right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, in hospice. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, it was. Anyway, it was so yeah. I mean, there you go. It's like he played it as big as he could, or or <clears throat> he was wise about playing it big because you feel it. Because it's kind of, it's not comical, but it is kind of like an yeah. extreme face. It's makes funny because he gets killed rising. in Jaws, too. He's good at dying. Oh, yeah. He's killed in Jaws. Yeah, yeah absolutely. He's, I wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about him. Like, sure. Because um, his career is, um, I wouldn't say it's confusing, but it's just like, there's this great film he made called The Luck of Ginger Coffee from 1964. Mm-hmm. And uh, I watched that a few years ago, and it was it was quite fetching, you know, because he's um, you know from I he's Ir- Irish, right? Yeah, he's Irish. Yep. And that was like an I- Irish film, and um, and then he sort of had he wasn't a big star or anything like that, but he was a respected actor, and I think he did a lot of stage work. But I think you can the Bond bet movie, that, right? I mean, that was oh, like he was in which the Bond, one was he in? Uh, he, he was in one of the early Bond films. Oh, and wow! He plays opposite Connery. Maybe the second one. And he is like he's uh, sort of the main baddie. Like, oh, it's of the in uh, from Russia sort of with like love. One step ahead of right. Is it yeah from Russia, Russia with love? love. Yep, yeah, yep. And uh, he's sort of the one. He's like oh, he's cool. like a, he, on par with Bond as like a badass spy who's like outsmarts him a bunch of times and stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna have to rewatch that because yeah, I love Robert Shaw. And it's just, I guess what I'm thinking here is just like uh, he wasn't bankable exactly. I mean, he was in a Bond movie, but this is this movie kind of broke him. It's sort of tragic. What I'm trying to say is like. It broke him, and he became a big player because of Pelham. And mm-hmm. then he was in an absolutely enormous film, and he fucking slayed it in Jaws. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and then he died. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like he did a little more stuff, um, crap. You know, like he did this movie called Swashbuckler. <coughs> right. And uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, believe it or not, I loved Jaws so much that I begged to see S- Swashbuckler. <laughs> <laughs> because it had Quint in it, you know, yeah, and it that. was sucked. It was boring. And then he was in like I think it's gonna be Avalanche Express. Do you have Do you have any is is filmography there? Yeah, I can I can bring it up. He, Avalanche he's... Express is a pretty. It was yeah. I think released posthumously, and it's derided. It's one of those movies where like there's like 50 actors and they walk on and they one day on the set. Uh, Avalanche Express, right? Is well, his last film? Yeah, he's also, you know, in Black Sunday. I think that might. Yeah, be he's he's last. the baddie in Black mm-hmm. Sunday, which is yeah. pretty yeah. schlocky too. Yeah. So, I don't know. He could have he could have had a more. I would have loved that he didn't die and that he had a better agent or something like that because, like, you know, he would he would have killed it in all kinds of movies. Mm-hmm. You know, in, was he a stage? A- he was a stage actor and a TV actor, right? Wasn't he? Or was yeah. he not a stage actor? He was right. That was I, his deal? I, I had the impression. I, I'm yeah. not 100% sure, but right. I, I thought yeah. he was. I just I just have a feeling that like lots of booze must have been in the equation, right? Oh, yeah. He's definitely a booze guy. He's that a booze. seems to be like every time people talk about him on set, they're okay. like, how wonderful he was, but like how he was difficult, boozy, but very, very sharp. And yeah. like he would sort of like ag- ag- aggressive mentally, I guess, sort yeah. of like challenge everyone and it's one way of putting know, it like, yeah, like, like kind of oliver yeah, reed like, was well, it like well, oliver? The, the, the giving the uh uss indianapolis speech oh that's legendary obviously mm-hmm. um, oh right right <laughs> there's like yeah, there's booze involved and there's like two takes 
you know, there's in, a drunken in, in, take and like a sober take, right? Yeah, yes. and I think they cross cut yes. uh, in the editing for right, the final right. version. But um, but he's kind of like anyway. Oliver I just like, wanted to give him some respect, Robert yeah. Shaw. But we can I don't know. We can get well, back into maybe a, well, a little just bit quick of a cast out. shout out. Well, just while we're doing oh, cast sure. real quick, there's there's a couple famous dads in this movie too. You got uh, James oh. Broderick, yep. <laughs> Matthew Broderick's dad. Yep, as who's the, that? Train, he's the train conduct the train driver at the very beginning. The guy's the actually beginning. driving the train. <sighs> Matthew Broderick's dad, Whoa. who's also in um, Dog Day Afternoon, briefly. Like a oh yeah, he's movie. one of the he's one of the uh, FBI guys, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Oh, that guy. <laughs> yep. So okay. That's weird. So yeah, it's just I was, uh, I was like, who is that? I was like, is yeah. that Henry Fonda? <laughs> like at he's first, got that, yeah. that Broderick yeah. thing coming through. I guess. Yeah, like, but I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. And yeah. then of course Jerry Stiller, which is like oh. great to see him in this movie. I, yeah. The first time I saw this movie, I did not re- make the connection. You know. Oh. Um, sure. Yeah, but uh, and no, he's great. great. <laughs> he's great in it too. It's cool to have two kind of comic actors in it. You know, for yeah. him, Matt out to have somebody. He plays off of Still- Jerry Stiller's delivering a lot of funny lines. Almost everything out of his mouth is a joke. Yeah. And then you've got the other guy in the office who's being a total dick to Matt out, who's like a hostile. Yeah, character. I love that he, and he's Me sort too. of like having to talk to both those guys. So. Yeah, 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 manage their their personalities. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because Matt out does get a comic partner. Yeah. with Stiller and those scenes are, are, are really rich and then there's the um, how about how about the uh, racially insensitive punchline uh, uh, little I, narrative in the beginning of the film oh, I'm only yeah. saying this in this sense where you know you can um, ride the train of the film and mm-hmm. in, in the beginning and think oh boy we're mocking the Japanese businessmen who are visiting the New York City right. subway system and be like seeing it through the eyes of 1974 and a character like Walter Matthau. But then the movie's cute and it has a little punchline because it, it really, its heart is a comedy. You know, like, uh, you know, they, they, you know, he's treating, Matthau's treating him like, I'm going to just start saying insulting things because these fucking idiots don't know what I'm <laughs> saying, right, guys? You know, that kind of thing. That old, yeah. that old shtick. But then, of course, one of the uh, Japanese businessmen is a like, few uh, of them. Yeah. It was very nice. To have you accommodate us, yeah, right? right. <laughs> Visit. We will right. see you soon. Yeah. You know, and then it's yeah. like, like punchline, womp yeah. womp. You know, and so. You know. Is that, it's well, funny. Mad Men does the same, <laughs> the same shtick. You know, what they, is that? What? what well, they, they have like the Honda guys come in, oh. like the guys, the Japanese executives from Honda. I don't remember. Come right. in and they're like showing them around the office, and I'm sure this was just in their head when they're writing that stuff. You know. Yeah. Oh, you know it. You know it. Yeah, and what was that? Who 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 delivers that line in the film about like what did they expect for their lousy thirty five cents to live for? I know. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, it's it's that it's that uh, the the guy whose like responsibility is simply like keep the trains going. Oh you know? yeah, that's I man. love. I don't I don't know the actor, but like I love him. And um, great line. <laughs> he says something that, that I think that airplane, the movie airplane, echoes his line. If you remember in airplane, yeah. there's this one of the many funny things is it's the media coverage of the plane that's, you know, doomed, right? Yeah. yeah. So everyone's covering it. And there's this show like point counterpoint. And, you know, the, the guy who's got a counterpoint viewpoint is like, they, they knew what they were getting into. They paid the ticket. Let him yeah. crash. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's this right. quite contrarian opinion where everyone else is alarmed and yeah, praying right. for the, for the, for the victims. And um, I swear that's that's got to be a reference to um, him because he's basically be. saying like, uh, "Let's get these trains back up, let them crash," you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean this um, movie. Oh, the mayor. Oh, like which I, was so weird. Sorry, I'm I guess I'm on trivia duty tonight, but like that mayor, I, I was like, "Where I know that guy as a mayor in some other fucking movie? What is it?" And I realized, incredible it's Batman. 1989 Batman that fucking guy plays the mayor in that movie too I, I, I don't get it it's like <laughs> did this moment happen where they're the Batman you know like like pre-production is like uh, the Pelham guy and it's like <laughs> yeah. really like it's the only mayor I can think of yeah and and we were talking about this a little bit earlier it's like yeah I don't know the history of like early 70s mayoral New York but like yeah. I do know enough where John Lindsay cast a big shadow in, in that he was, um, mm. and all I really understand is just that he he became sort of a national figure, you know, yeah. like he he was he was like I think he was you know like handsome and kind of like the JFK of mayors for New York yeah. that kind of thing, right? And charismatic sort of, and um, I think maybe they had some real duds before him and they definitely did after, and then they had Koch, you know, mm-hmm. Mayor Ed, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know. There's something about I think there's these sideways digs at 
oh, yeah. the topical thing of Mayor Lindsay. Totally. And that he's kind of vain and like an egomaniac and like is an effectual. Over, yeah, but I don't, but also like 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 thinking about his image. Yeah, all and there's, only there's I mean, some there's all these digs at Lindsay, and I I'm not getting them. You know, well, well there's there also like there's also kind of like biting social commentary. I feel like in in all those scenes where you know um, obviously it's very cynically about the votes you know uh, for him uh, to save these kind of seventeen strangers. I mean that is kind of the you know, big joke of this whole movie in some way, you know, is we're paying a million dollars for these assholes, yeah. you know, 17, like, who gives a shit New Yorkers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. You know, right. but, um, and so that, that, that is kind of played with very amusingly in the movie, but also mm -hmm. just the idea that you, you know, he has the, the sort of campaign or he's got the deputy mayor guy who's really in control of everything. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and just the way that it's sort of cynically portrayed is this guy's an idiot. And he doesn't know when he can't make a decision. He has to look. He's like, he wants else. to, I just want to lie in bed today and watch soap operas or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Right. Is that what yeah. he's watching or like yeah. game shows? Or game something? shows. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. some kind of, it's, it's, it is, it's, it's a highly satirical moment of the film. The mayor yeah. is mm -hmm. not treated uh, right. the, the, with respect whatsoever. And actually, you know, one thing I want to say too, is like, you know, to extend out, there's a few more people in this film. I always wish that I, I was seeing it for the first time again, because I love the surprise that that quiet hippie in oh, the car as yeah. the passengers, yeah. he doesn't, say, no hey. one talks to him. He doesn't say anything. And he suddenly, cause they do, they say like, there's an undercover guy. Yeah. That's amazing. You no. Know, and then, and it's and like, uh, but then you sort of forget. woman too. You know, well, there's, there's that. Like, yes. Right. mentioned a couple but, times. Right. And then like, but also your mind though, isn't really like, like the film doesn't work it where it's like uh you know you're panning the uh, the, the the crowd of passengers yes. and it's like which one mm -hmm. of them is the cop you kind of it's in the back of your mind is what i'm trying to say and Brilliant. then suddenly he you know jumps up he's got a gun he takes action he's, he's like a fake hippie cop serpico that serpico. must be a serpico reference it has to be you know what i mean has yeah. to be yeah it has to be. exactly and then but but his uh the end of his arc is is another comedic moment in the film if you caught that, <laughs> he gets shot, not fatally, but he's shot. He's lying in the down in the uh, tracks, and Matthau's there going through things with Shaw, and he just looks down at the, uh, you know, uh, the undercover oh, cop with this, very long yeah. hair. Did you catch that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's he very long. He's like, you'll, be, you'll be okay, miss, or whatever. You'll be okay, right? miss. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's just like that's fucking funny, dude. <laughs> you know, that is very seventies, like yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that generation. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's very funny. They thought the Beatles yeah. had long hair in 1964, right? When their yeah. hair was yeah, like yeah. this long. Well, I mean, the guy does have legit long hair, and he's <laughs> lying down, face down. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about it's that just actor. Amusing, you know? And I he delivers the line so well, Matthew. Yeah. You know? I guess that's why they keep saying it could be a girl, too. You know, I thought there was a misdirect, you know, this I, time through, but that, it's all leading up that, to that yeah. line, kind of. Well, it's leading up to that line, I guess, you know, where he's like. Well, it's. It's sort of confirmation bias that it is a it is a he does he really think it is a woman right right well to yeah. me it's to <laughs> I me, believe so he's not being a, saucy is what I'm saying no no it's such a it's such a um a, a great touch you know that the script maybe necessarily didn't need but it's it's great the to idea, have the undercover guy yeah just to have this undercover like oh, I know. that somebody well, on the train could be a cop. And we're yeah, not going to be let in. Like, there's no, I know. there's no Hitchcock moment where we know and the guys don't know. That, you know? and that it would Hitchcock would make that move where you, you as the viewer have the awareness and yes. like, there's the tension of like, what uh, might he do and when? Right. And it's all going to be it, your mind just has to retroactively go the whole time. This guy's mind is stewing and going, I can't make a move right now. And I still can't make a move yeah. right now. And it's like, what move would I make right now if I could make him? You know, if I wanted. He doesn't get featured really at all before nope. that. You know, no. just in, he's just one of he's one of the even lesser. He doesn't have a line of dialogue. They like, would never else, do that today. They would yeah. they would give him yeah like, oh, a part before. I, I have another little thing where there's like a, a, a sort of an odd little uh, placement of a character. Is I love the cop, the plain clothesman, who is initially going down to check things out. <laughs> And, um, you know, he gets in a little bit of back and forth gunfire and he ditches and hides out oh, you know, yeah. behind the railing or whatever. Yeah. And it's funny because yeah. he's there the whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's Weird. this, what I'm saying is like, he's, he's, um, an outlier for like both the, the, the robbers mm -hmm. and the police. Like he's sort of placed, you know, um, he mm -hmm. wasn't, he didn't plan on this and right. he's sort of stuck between them, but mm -hmm. he's like figuring out like, how can I help? And like, he's, you know, isn't he making uh, calls? 
very quietly. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm here, yes. guys. Yeah, I'm here. Yes, we can't know. hear you. And then he's like, you better tell them I'm here because I don't want to be caught in the fucking crossfire. In the crossfire. Know? Yeah, yeah. I like yeah. that. I thought that was a nice touch. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, and yeah, so just just that kind of... Uh, the, this uh another layer yeah uh, the things. cops fuck it up too right they they uh there's the cops in the tunnel that yep. shoot like a bullet towards the guy and it very creates stupid the whole thing yes. you know and like yep. so they're not portrayed like as like necessarily her like all evenly heroic there's like a chaos that's true there. yeah yeah you're right you're right yeah like um like a guy gets a little too cocky and he well, he starts blasting off, and, and that gets it, Shaw triggered, and and it's un, it, inadvisable to to yeah. do uh, to start firing. And that's you know? of course a thing with Walter Matthau's character is he feels this sense of wanting to make sure that he's in control of the operation because other mm-hmm. people are going to go rogue and do create. That's always the tension in these sort of hostage negotiation thrillers. Yeah. You know? Well, there's also this weird hierarchy. Like, isn't Mathel like the MTA head <laughs> yeah. or the MTA police chief yeah, or MTA something police, and it's like yeah right and then, but then there's the police the police and you know yeah. all that kind of stuff so right yeah it's crazy yeah I mean the, the, the I always think about the shit that those MTA detectives and cops see man it must be fucking crazy dude I would that's a job I would not like want. being a but, cop in hell or sorry go ahead yeah basically all day like going yeah. down to, down to hell yeah uh, quick shout out to the soundtrack <laughs> oh fuck <laughs> Yep. David Shire. We got a minute, right? Yep. Cool. One fucking yeah. minute. David Shire. Great soundtrack. It was not released. There's no vinyl. I really, this is one of those great miss, you know, uh, missed opportunities. opportunities. There's no like nice, like $50 vinyl 1974 <laughs> release at all. It did come out on CD in the 2000s. I have it here somewhere, actually. Let me dig it up in, after. And then um, it, it's a great soundtrack, propulsive. Mm-hmm. It, it's a big characteristic in the movie, the bump, bump, bump. Like he's mm-hmm. trying to make funk that has kind of like a moving down it's got that track. That big backbeat drums. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's been sampled. Showbiz and AG, shout out. And mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, just David Sherrod did one of the the big, you know, cop, cop movie soundtracks, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. He also did All the President's Men and The Conversation. Ooh, too. wow. So. Slick. conversation too shit oh shit uh, yeah so. there you go and directed by his brother-in-law right francis that's because his brother-in-law talia, talia got shire from david shire right there you go. hey you like them apples <laughs> he also I did the, uh, the 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 non-bg's Bee music for saturday night fever oh wow <laughs> all right really? yeah all right there you there go, you go. A little visit to New York. A little visit to New York here for one fucking hour on taking Pelham one two three, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Nice I mean, day. again, if you yeah. haven't seen the movie in any amount of time, you should it's definitely worth going back and checking out again. It's such a great time. It's 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 really uh, really rewarding to to go back and check that movie out. So yeah, it's it's just so zippy. That's just my takeaway. It's like it's a zipper. Like more movies should be zippy like that. It was just makes you totally. feel like. There's a yep. lost art to zippy, you know? There is. There is. Yeah. There right? definitely is. There definitely is. Totally. So, all right, everybody, that was one fucking hour on Taking a Pelham 123. Um, thank you very much. And uh, let's get into, of course, what we're doing next week for episode 102. We teased it a little bit. I don't know when we teased it, maybe several weeks ago, but we, we've we been feeling, I think it was last week for our 100th episode when we were rewatching the clips from our disclosure babe oh yeah episode oh yeah <laughs> and being so and, and remembering what a great time that was the bouncing mullet shout out to D- david yeah. chen reminding us yes, of that episode exactly the <laughs> the beleaguered cd rom manufacturer being our central character you know there's just that period of <laughs> 90s thrillers is such a great watchable fun time in cinema yeah. And, and we, we're real. We it's funny. We all realize, like, wait, you love those stupid movies too. You yeah, know, like, right. uh, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, like, yeah. like, it's not a guarantee. Yeah. that all three of us would be like, oh, I fucking love them. You know, yeah, sign yeah, me up. Yeah. They yeah. hit a sweet spot for sure. They do. Yeah. yeah, they do. They're very watchable. So we're gonna so take that energy. We are, and it's kind of like out of the fact of that. I think we're just kind of exploding with wanting to talk about so many of those types of movies. Frankly, it was hard to pick one. Yeah, it was so hard to like, pick one. Well, then there's Ding and Dong and Dingle, and they're all kind of the same. <laughs> right. You know, like, right. There's also that like, but are we really gonna be able to do a whole hour? On yeah, there's that too. There is that too. But here's so, the thing. 
So here's the thing. So let me just explain. We've brought it up on the show before a few times, but I think these movies are characterized. I think like a good way to characterize them is that more likely than not, they were probably when they when, when they were released on DVD. These types of '90s thrillers, erotic thrillers, were probably most likely released in what I call a snapper case, the the the, <laughs> the cardboard paper, you know, DVD right. packaging with a snapping case, right? The, the click on the case, <laughs> yeah. which which they you know like they don't do that anymore. No, you know, there was some don't. kind of idea where it's like. Yeah. Click down and get that case locked and secured. You <laughs> yeah, know? It, it seems like the the cardboard was like the driving factor. Like, I let's guess get these like records. You know, there was a time when CDs started coming out like in yeah. cardboard, paper cases. You know, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they were like these discs get scratched. We gotta we gotta snap them in place. Yeah, so all right. Came so up with that uh, technology. Right. So so it was the <laughs> snapper DVDs. You know, m- more times than not, like these movies. You know. You know, like the Bone Collector. I don't know. I'm trying to come up with Jeez. like you know these movies. Are we like, doing this? Well, I mean, well, uh, well, Copycat, uh, Murder disclosure, Pros. What's up? Disclosure. In dreams. Of course, yeah, all these movies you could find. You know, if, if they didn't come out on Snap or DVD cases, they might as well have. So, what we're going to be talking about next week for episode 102 is our top 10 Snapper Core 90s thrillers. Strap in, get ready. We're going to do another top 10 show. Very excited. And just we're going to kind of throw around some of our favorite Snapper films and, uh, yeah, shed some light on movies that nobody else is talking about on YouTube. That's for sure. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, I think we are, uh, yeah. cutting some new territory here yeah. for ourselves. <laughs> I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, these movies are just are just inherently equal fun for me. I love these episodes where you have to watch, like, you don't watch just one movie for it. You have to watch, like, 10. 10. <laughs> That's yeah, great. Of course. It's great homework. <laughs> or you've seen these films yes. so many times. You could, yes. You know, Marcus recite the, the dialogue. Marcus will have to watch all 10. Okay. I'll so that, that'll be next week. Um, uh, so definitely stay tuned for the top 10 snappers episode. Also want to give a quick last final shout out to two things. One, the one fucking hour, Patreon, patreon.com slash one fucking hour, uh, is of course where you can sign up for five bucks a month to become part of our Patreon, get instant access to our bonus episodes like the one we just dropped, which is our first Q and a episode. Ask us anything here at one fucking hour. Uh, so the fan base asked us questions. Uh, we responded to them. A lot of fun uh, shit was discussed there. A lot of, a lot of potential future episode ideas. And yeah. like, would we do this? Would we not do this? What do we think of X, Y, and Z? A lot of recommendations people wanted for sorts of things. So if you want to hear that, get on the Patreon to watch that episode. And of course, this is your final week to get your pre-order in for the One Fucking Hour t-shirt, which is available right now at the link in the description. Uh, they come in two different uh, colors. There's the black and then there's the gray. Uh, it's a, it's hand printed, hand screen printed, front and back uh, of the logo on the front and the back, as Tom mentioned earlier, our first 100 episodes to commemorate, of course, that we did 100 episodes. So if you want to get your One Fucking Hour tea and represent in uh, fucking IRL, get in the link in the description and order it now. Um, all right, everybody. Well, we can't leave you, uh, of course, uh, without your moment of Zen. <laughs> and uh, all right, everybody. <laughs> have a great rest of your week, and we will see you for uh, Snapper Core, man. Very excited. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Snap you later. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And, of course, the wonderful director, Joseph Sargent. Good guy. He survived the Battle of the Bulge, by the way. It was terrific. I went in for the interview. Just an interview. Sat across the table, and we chatted about this, about that, about food, about Italy, about Spain, history. Never mentioned the war, by the way. He just sat there and says, okay, all right. So we start so-and-so and so-and-so. Are you ready? Are you up to that? Are you, is that good for you? I said, yes, it's fine. <laughs> is it good for me? Does Pinocchio have wooden buttons, you know? Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. That was wicked, man.